Good morning. Putting our first yellow cake in the can in April of this year with our 100 per cent owned honeymoon uranium mine was a hugely significant milestone for the company. It proved our lixivient chemistry in the well fields was working properly and that our iron exchange processing plant was working at commercial scale. And then a few months later in June of this year, we announced that our 30 per cent held Ultimisa uranium mine in South Texas also commenced production. So here we are. In just the last few months, we have achieved a number of significant industry milestones, becoming the first uranium producer in Australia for the past decade, and with Ultimisa becoming the first ASX producer having multi-mine assets in two tier one jurisdictions in recent times. But building mines take time, particularly for uranium projects, and it's getting harder in this regulatory environment that we are situated in. Honeymoon's taken over half a century to reach commercial production in which we've achieved. From the early 70s when uranium was first discovered to then trying out in situ recovery means of mining methods, as you can see here by old photos with the backyard swimming pool, um, to the to construction of demonstration plant in the 1980s. So I was very proud to stand here today with the release of our ASX announcement this morning, announcing that our production ramp up has hit key milestones as Honeymoon's first NIMP6 column has already reached nameplate production capacity. Our second column is due to commence production capacity in September and more columns to follow. But it's really important to note as we walk through this presentation that there, while there are a lot of other development uranium mines hanging there in the wings waiting to come on, it's becoming more, increasingly more difficult to do so. More projects are finding that they're infrastructurally deprived to come on to, to, and more remote and an increasingly stressed environments such as human resources potential and talent. The access to water, to power, to people are getting increasingly harder and they'll most certainly be focused on more stringent regulatory uh, requirements that they have to get through. So trust me, a lot of these other development projects that say they can come on are going to struggle. And not only from a timing perspective, but also because the cost curves to bring new mines in development are increasing. And therefore, a higher incentive price or a higher uranium price is needed to bring new production online. So knowing the challenges in the industry, we set about ourselves the task when we acquired the project back in uh, 2015 to look at the challenges and focus on our own industry strength. We've got a board that's one of the leading uh, in Australia with a vast experience of over 100 years within the uranium industry. We focused on vision and strategy. We focused on foundation and development. We focused on organic growth, and now we're beginning to look at mergers and acquisitions and how can we take this company forward. But it was really that four key four-tier approach to look at that inevitable turn in the uranium cycle which we're now facing. So we set about being a 2.5 million pound producer in Australia. We wanted to get an exploration target up to 100 million pounds. We wanted to build upon our solid relationships within the industry with fuel buyers, with, with actual state governments and federal government. We then looked upon getting that right management team, that proven board that have had the experience of actually building uranium mines, developing projects, exporting around the world. We then looked to how could we maximise the market. So we bought 1.25 million pounds of uranium. We raised $60 million back in March 2020 at a price of 30.15 US per pound. With the price now at 81 US per pound, that's delivered over three times return profit. So it's been a fantastic outcome, but again, it's just being aligned with the market, choosing our opportunities and really building this company, waiting for that turn in uranium price. From organic growth, we've grown the resource from, uh, from uh, just uh, up to 72 million pounds chalk resource. We've also acquired new exploration assets, Kinloch, some 120 kilometres to our south in South Australia and also in the Eyre Peninsula and again looking at further opportunities within that region. And now for mergers and acquisitions. Well, the acquisition of Ultimisa, that 30% stake, is with one, arguably one of the top operating teams in the US, um, with Paul Goringson and Bill Sharif leading the way there. Um, and they're doing fantastically well, but we're focused on tier one jurisdictions. We're focused on Australia, we're focused on the US, and we're focused on Canada. And we are in the ASX 200 during this period of growth. 
So there we are really pictorially, uh, South Australian asset, again, first uranium mine in Australia in the past decade. It's the third uranium producing mine in South Australia. South Australia is the premier uranium district within Australia. Both sides of government support uranium mining. You've got Olympic Dam, Heathgate and ourselves. We also, having produced our first drum of uranium in April, we're now ramping up our process, as you can see in the coming slides. And there in South Texas, well, they're about to produce their first drum this month. So it's terribly exciting to be um, involved in a company with two producing mine in two tier one jurisdictions. The shareholder returns over this journey since we joined has been quite, quite phenomenal. Over a 42% uh, total shareholder return since joining, and that's on an annualised basis to get to where we are today. Of all the money raised since joining, $443 million, we still have a quarter of a billion dollars on our balance sheet in assets. We have absolutely zero debt. And remember, nuclear is recession proof. You can't simply turn a nuclear power plant on or off. Mined uranium plants are there with the demands there, and we're here to sort of meet that up and coming demand. When we look at Honeymoon itself, we've really technically advanced this project. We've upgraded the Jork resource, we've taken care of permitting requirements, and we've built further upon those relationships with government. Not only did we raise um, that sort of money for the strategic inventory, but we also raised funds for our um, CAPEX in that $125 million, and then announcing the final investment decision in June 21 to turn the site around, this picture in front of you, to really revitalise it. So this was the picture before we had actually started our construction activities. The question then leads to, why come into production now? What was the precursors? Why not wait till we see a higher uranium price? And that really is that with our first mover advantage, by turning around this distressed asset, this restart project, we're there now for these higher prices and knowing that other development projects are going to struggle to come online, we can really capture these higher prices. They're arguably the strongest uranium fundamentals since the 2000s. When we refer to Honeymoon as a uranium restart mine, it's actually the rebuild of a front end of the processing plant. So if you can see where the iron exchange uh, circle is there, we've ripped out those solvent extraction columns and put in iron exchange columns. So currently we have three iron exchange columns. We're going to a maximum of six, uranium, uh, six iron exchange columns. We've also introduced new well filled techniques such that we can leach uranium at a higher grade and also access um, more, more th throughput from those well fields than our predecessors were able to achieve, and that's by using a more superior lixiviant, using acid and ferric as an oxidant. Then we looked at our water treatment plant, and if you think of the groundwater in, in, Western, in Australia, it's largely salinity. So our water treatment plant effectively removes that salt content such that we have almost potable water as lixivian going through our well fields to enhance the leachability of that, that uranium. And finally, we focused on the drying circuit where we've introduced a kiln um, uh, that can bake the final product at 800 degrees Celsius, and such we meet the highest um, stringent demands that customers are requiring. So not UF4, we're producing U308. And we've achieved all of this by self-performing. So we did away with the idea of going EPCM type model. We recruited our own engineers, our own designers, we did our own procurement, and we managed the project ourselves. And by doing that, we've saved shareholders significant value as we've achieved, um, achieved this growth. So walking through what we've just uh, now taking a sort of a closer look at what we've actually achieved, here's the RO plant, which we've grown by a multitude of 10 uh, compared to what it was previously. So essentially by the time the groundwater gets that RO plant, we then strip it of the chlorine or the salt content, and that's where we flush and use that clean RO potable water through the well field. We use in situ recovery as a form of mining. So what that is is really using barren leach solution. We inject that through injection wells and then we force it back up through extraction wells, essentially a five spot pattern, one injection well, four extraction wells to really um, get that pregnant leach solution that's then hosting uranium in a fluid and then we pump that to the surface and pump that to the front end of the processing plant. The beauty of in situ recovery, it's about two thirds the cost of conventional uh, mining and it's the most common means of mining in the downturn of the last 10 years. The reasoning for that 
that is it's far cheaper than open pit mining, hence why it accounts for about 60 per cent of the world's current method of mining in, um, of, of uranium. Uh, there's an example of just one of the well fields being constructed or being developed that's now fully connected and that's actually where we're operating from. But you can see how closely adjacent it sits to the actual operating plant. That will account with two other well fields nearby for about the first year of production. And in fact, in that just region that you can see in front of you, that's about three years of production, high grade averaging about 1100 ppm. When we then look from there, the well field gets pumped to that front end of the plant. It actually goes with us. We, we, at Honeymoon, we put it into a pregnant leach solution such that different wells produce different tenors of uranium or different grades. By putting it into a pond, we can balance that solution. What you want is a consistent solution going into the ion exchange columns, which you can see in the background there where the crane's oversitting, uh, oversitting that SX column putting in the ion exchange columns. And here you can actually see, so part of that sort of self-performing um, methodology is that we've bought all our own auxiliary equipment. So that crane we purchased and we can now sell at a profit, but there it is taking out the old solvent extraction columns. Um, in NIM6, this was the only item that we purchased overseas from South Africa, fabricated overseas. All the other equipment, the piping, the kilns, etc., the calciners, purchased from Australia. So here it is, the first NIM6 column arriving on site. And then with our crane, we're then installing uh, the first iron exchange column, uh, which was uh, late last year. And now here we are today, and this isn't in the announcement this morning. So we've actually, the first column's been operating on the left there since uh, fit mar uh, April of this year. The second column now is about to start production this month. The third column's due for production in December, all aligned with our feasibility study um, and all producing very well. So what was particularly pleasing this morning was column one's achieved nameplate capacity. So by that it can reach up to 400,000 um, 400, um, pounds per year of production. Each NIM6 column proportionally increases the production rate and our gradual ramp up, and this is the reason why, is column by column, we're just gonna grow into our production profile. So very, very um, exciting and pleased to show this picture and how far we've come. So right now, um, by the June quarter, we'd, we'd produced about 57,000 pounds of uranium. In just these past two months, we've produced 72,000 pounds of uranium. And that NIM6 uh, NIM column two being commissioned, well, uh, column three about to be commissioned, the next three columns will be commissioned in the first half of next year. We've now sold uranium in July and we've started collecting revenue for that as well and banking revenue. So remember, quarter of a billion dollars in asset, Abs on the balance sheet, absolutely zero debt, and we're cash flow positive to take advantage of this next cycle. In addition, we've got a lot of exploration potential. Our mining license, with, which is the feasibility study, has 36 million pounds. In addition, we've got an extra 36 million pounds sitting on two satellite deposits that we're now looking to license. Just recruited a COO who will be joining us mid-September, and his key task will be licensing these projects, which we're ready. We've done extensive drilling on over the most recent sort of 12 months with Gould's Dam and Jason's. So um, very, very exciting just within that near term term play, satellite plants, the product can be trucked or trunked, uh, piped back to the honeymoon processing plant. As mentioned earlier, we've got our projects in Kinloch, which is some 120 kilometres to the south. Again, these were awarded to us by government, um, such that given our um, success and exploration, to really prove those assets up. And in total, we've got about 6,000 square kilometres now of exploration potential in South Australia, the premier uranium district of Australia. And already we've got a strategy, so we've grown our drawk resource from 16.5 million pounds, that's 72 million pounds today, and it's set to increase. But having all that land package, we're also aware that there are other commodities. So we've got joint venture agreements with the likes of First Quantum, Coda Minerals and others. Ultimisa, I'm running out of time, but basically it is one of the best ISR projects in the US. It's set to produce for over 20 years, and it's a fantastic outcome that they're also about to start producing uranium uh, in, in this year, it, sorry, in this month. And with that, we'll get 30% of the offtake such that we can deliver into our own sales strategy. 200,000 square uh, uh, acres of exploration tenements, they've only explored 5%, so there's enormous upside to come with that project. 
With our development team, we've got over 100 years of experience. Um, they're relatively, where all directors are available to speak with shareholders, and please do come and see me at the booth today uh, if you have any further questions. And finally, our contracting strategy is such that we're going to layer contracts into this market. We're not going to rush out and sell our life of mine resource right now. We're not going to hedge our book. We're actually going to strategically take advantage of this uranium cycle as it continues to grow. And grow it will, because supply is tight. The Kazakhstan, world's largest producing country, is running into their own problems with sulfuric acid, Chinese ownership, Russian ownership. There's a rising long-term price, and demand is increasing. So to conclude, the fundamentals at the start of this new cycle have never, ever been stronger. It's at 81 US a pound term price, which is the highest it's ever been at the start of a cycle. Nuclear power is recession proof. You can't turn a nuclear power plant on or off, and demand for uranium is simply not going away. So nor has that net zero carbon emission targets for government policy. Uranium is here to stay, and BOSS, with its first mover advantage, has a terrific opportunity to take advantage of this new cycle. Thank you.